Welcome everybody to this evening's presentation, the wreck of the Edmund Fitzgerald ship, storm and song presentation. Thanks for joining us today. I'm Joy Schwartz with the Winifox Library System based in Oshkosh, Wisconsin. I'm here to help Lisa Zwicky, director of the Poi Sippy Public Library with tonight's webinar. Before I ask Lisa to introduce our presenter, I have a few tips for communicating with us this evening. Your microphone and webcam are not needed and will not be used during the webinar. All attendees' microphones have been muted. If you have a question during the webinar, click or tap the Q&A icon on your Zoom toolbar and type in your question. You may type in your question at any time. Steve plans to answer your questions at the end of the webinar. Even though you'll see a chat icon in your toolbar, that function is turned off today. The webinar is being recorded and will be closed captioned and available at the Winifox Library System's YouTube page. Tomorrow, I'll send you an email that has a link to the recording. With that, I'll hand things over to Lisa so she can introduce Steve. Good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining us this evening. I'd like to tell you a bit about Dr. Steve Hackerman. Ackerman. Um, he joined the UW-Madison faculty in the Department of Atmospheric and Oceanic Science in 1992. He served as director of the Cooperative Institute for Meteorological Satellite Studies from 1999 to 2019. He is currently the vice chancellor for research and graduate ed education at UW-Madison. He is one of the weather guys who appears monthly on Wisconsin Public Radio to discuss the weather and climate. The weather guys also write a weekly blog and a column for the Wisconsin State Journal, which answers people's weather questions. So, Steve, we're ready when you are. Okay, thank you, Lisa and Joy, uh, and everybody else for uh, coming and being uh, at this talk. Uh, happy to do this virtually um, as I try and figure out how to share. There we go. Um, uh, and, you know, who knows, maybe someday we'll be able to uh, do this um, physically uh, in presence. But what, what I wanted to do today um, was to talk about the sinking of the Edmund Fitzgerald, the ship, the storm, uh, and the song. This is an amazing story, I think. Uh, for a number of reasons. One is the Edmund Fitzgerald uh, was the pride of the American side. It's a very famous boat. Uh, it broke a lot of records uh, and its sinking was somewhat of a mystery um, and still in some ways controversial and unknown about how it actually really did sink, although I'll be presenting what I think the reasons were. I think in terms of shipwrecks, uh, it is only surpassed in books and film and other media only by the sinking of the Titanic. Uh, and I think a maze, major reason for that, or one reason for that, is because of um, the 1976 ballad, The Wreck of the Edmund Fitzgerald, uh, sung by folk singer Gordon Lightfoot. So what I would like to do first is to talk a little bit about the ship. Then I'm gonna talk a little bit about the storm. And then I'll talk a little bit about the song. Uh, and then I'll spend most of the time integrating those three things together. So we could look at what happened uh, on that um, fateful day. Um, so about the ship, um, I think many of us uh, are now aware of, um, or if not, uh, the ship sank on November 10th. 1975, it was the SS Edmund Fitzgerald. It sank on Lake Superior. Uh, all 29 crew members died. So uh, at the time it was the worst shipping disaster um, on the Great Lakes in 11 years. And I think, and it still remains that way. Um, it's a very interesting story, I think, as we go through this, but I also think it's really important um, that, you know, this accident, um, you know, cost the lives of 29 souls and to the families uh, and the folks that knew those folks, this was a very uh, serious and tragic uh, event. Uh, so 
more about the ship. It weighed over 13,000 tons. Uh, it was 729 feet long. Um, its horsepower was a steam engine turbine of uh, 7,000 horsepower, uh, which meant it could travel 16 miles per hour, which for a boat that size is uh, really amazing. Um, it was launched on June 7th uh, in 1958. Um, on the slide there, I have 10,000 people uh, had attended the launch, but uh, looking more into that, that was more estimated to be more like uh, 15,000 people showed up for the launch uh, of the ship. Um, it was labeled almost immediately the pride of the American flag uh, because it was a US ship. Uh, in 1964, it was the first ship on the Great Lakes to carry more than a million tons of iron ore through the Sioux Locks. Um, the ship itself broke many records, um, and I, I'm just pointing one of those out. Uh, this obviously is a picture of the ship um, down below here, and I'm using my little highlight pointer here to uh, show these 21 watertight hatches. Uh, and so the cargo was loaded into these hatchways into three central um, cargo holes. Uh, we'll talk more uh, about what it was carrying uh, on that day, but I wanted to point this out to give you a visual image of how the Telconite pellets were actually loaded uh, into the boat, excuse me. The storm. The storm was uh, what we call a mid-latitude cyclone. It's these winter storms uh, that we typically get. Uh, this storm uh, duration was, uh, we'll be talking about just the 9th to the 10th of November, 1975, pr primarily during that life cycle of the storm, which was very intense. And during those two days, it ravaged the uh, upper Great Lakes with winds in excess of storm force uh, on Lake Superior. Um, so you'll see later on, we'll be talking about winds at 50 miles per hour or so. So very strong storm, um, rare, but not unique. Uh, November has been known, if we've lived in Wisconsin for a while, uh, you've probably experienced one of these November intense storms in the Great Lake regions. There are two other noteworthy storms um, that I won't talk about now, uh, today, but we can talk about maybe at the question and answers. One is the Armistice Day storm of 1940, very similar to the storm that sank the Edmund Fitzgerald, uh, and it led to the death of over 150 duck hunters. Uh, and then in 1998, if you were around in Wisconsin, um, in around the same time, November 10th, 1998, we essentially had a storm very, very similar uh, to the Edmund Fitzgerald, and no one died during that time. Part of that is because our forecasting uh, had improved so much, uh, and communication as well. A little bit about the storm. Um, in 1975, when the storm went down, Gordon Lightfoot had read a Newsweek magazine article about the Edmund Fitzgerald, uh, and that led to him writing the ballad, The Wreck of the Edmund Fitzgerald, which was released the following year. Uh, it became a big hit, uh, reaching number one on the Billboard chart of the United States, and was number one in Canada. Uh, if you listen to classic rock stations, like I often do too, uh, you can actually still hear it being played uh, on the radio. So that's a little bit, just some background of the ship, the storm and the song. Now let's kind of look at the whole thing together um, and how it's integrated. You'll see as I go through this, I'm gonna pull some phrases out of the song nearly all of the song really represents what happened on that day. But there are some things that um, aren't quite right that I want to point out. And there are other things where they just took artist uh, um, creativity, if I can put it that way, which is great. I think it's really fine. So we're going to start with the opening of the stanza uh, of the storm. And since many of you are home, feel free to sing out loud as you read the lines. I am not gonna do that, uh, but you can more than welcome to do that. Uh, so as you uh, can read the words here or sing them, you know, that opening stanza is, the legend lives on from the Chippewa on down of the big lake they call Gitche The lake it is said never gives up her dead 
when the skies of November turned gloomy with a load of iron ore 26,000 tons more than the Edmund Fitzgerald weighed empty. So there are a couple of things I wanna point out about this opening stay, uh, stanza. First is um, the Ojibwe actually call the lake Gitchigami, uh, not Gitchigumi. Gitchigumi actually came forward uh, from Longfellow when he wrote Song of the Hiawatha. And so that kind of uh, misterminology has continued to uh, propagate. And I just wanted to point that out. The other uh, second line there, the lake it is said never gives up her dead when the skies of November turn gloomy. Doesn't have to be November uh, or in storms. Um, what he's referring to there is that as if you've been in Lake Superior, as many of us have, I think, it's unusually very cold water. Um, uh, in 1970s, during that time, uh, the average temperature was around 36 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, so a little bit above uh, freezing. That uh, will go into freezing of the lakes later on. The thing I wanted to point out there in terms of why it never gives up the dead, uh, and that is when somebody dies uh, in, a, in a water body and the body sinks, when it begins to decay because of the bacterial action, um, gases begin to blow the body. And it's those gases that then cause the float, the body to float to the surface after a few days. But in this case, the water is so cold, you don't get that bacterial action. So you don't get the gas. So the bodies don't eventually surface. Um, in my hand there, I'm showing the cargo that uh, the Edmund Fitzgerald carried. Um, they're talconite pellets. Um, they may look like uh, iron marbles, which in essence they are. This is what's loaded into those um, uh, cargo bays that I showed earlier. And the way they load them is they just roll them down a chute, right? So you can see they're spherical like marbles. So they roll very easy. And that'll come into play as we talk about the potential cause for the sinking. Uh, again, so again, in his song, uh, Lightfoot is pointing out again, which I stated earlier, that the ship is the pride of the American side coming back from some mill in Wisconsin. Uh, as big freighters go, it was bigger than most. <laughs> Actually, it was launched, it was the largest ship on the Great Lakes. Uh, and she remains the largest ship to have sunk uh, on the Great Lakes uh, as well. So yes, it was one of the biggest uh, freighters on the Great Lakes. Uh, again, back to the song, I hope you're singing along. Uh, concluding some terms with a couple of steel firms when they left fully loaded for Cleveland. Um, before I get to the map, I, I just wanna point out that they were not going to Cleveland. Uh, they were headed to Detroit um, where those talconite pellets, which are made of iron, uh, we're going to be used to make uh, some of the uh, uh, automobiles that were being produced in, in Detroit. So it was actually headed to Sault Ste. Marie. This is the path uh, of the Edmund Fitzgerald um, on those uh, between uh, November 9th, 1975 and November 10th. And this was where she signed. So you can see it was getting really close um, to port, um, not very far away. If you look at this map today, you may be thinking, why did they take that longer route? Why didn't they just go shorter and take this path down in here? Then maybe they would have made it uh, in time. And we'll talk about why they took that path. And it was driven by what the weather conditions uh, were going on at that time. Um, and so let's take a look at the weather. Uh, day one, the birth of the extra tropical cyclone. So gonna give a little, since I'm a weather guy, a little bit about uh, weather maps, um, some of which is probably uh, familiar to you. This is what the weather map looked like on November 8th, 1975 at 7 a.m. Eastern time. Um, I don't know why they do it in Eastern time back then. Um, now we do it in Greenwich Meridian, so it's more uniform, uh, but you'll see all the maps are in Eastern time. So we just kept it that way. 
Um, for those of you who follow weather maps, you might recognize that this blue line with the blue triangles represents a cold front. Um, the purple lines in here uh, with the half moons and the uh, triangles uh, represents a, a stationary front or an occluded front, I should say, an occluded front. And the L's represent low pressures. Uh, the symbols right in here are what we call the weather station models. So there's a whole bunch of parameters that uh, go into the weather, temperature, dew point, cloud cover, precipitation, wind speed, direction, et cetera. Um, and we've been very creative on how we can represent that in the map. And we're just showing a few of those. Not gonna point out those much. What I did wanna point out though, are these lines, these blue lines, which are lines of constant pressure. Um, and the wind speed is represented by these bars. And if you look quickly, you'll notice that when these lines are close, the wind speed is high. And when the lines are far apart, the wind speeds are low. So that'll be a quick way for you to look at the maps and tell where is the winds, uh, excuse me, on uh, the strongest. Uh, the other thing I wanna point out is where this uh, shaded blue green area, that's where precipitation is occurring. So we'll see that as the storm uh, develops. Actually, when you look at this weather map, it kind of looks very, um, not very exciting from a weather point of view, uh, but actually what we're looking at is this area right in here. This is going to be the development of these two lows is gonna end up being the storm that the gig ship and crew will be a bone to be chewed when the gales of November came early. Um, so when the skies of November turn gloomy, one of the things we do at meteorologists and climatologists is we analyze where do storms form and where do they go? And so two areas of what we call cyclogenesis or the development of one of these mid-latitude cyclones are up here in Canada, in Alberta, and down in here uh, around the panhandle of Oklahoma. Uh, the typical paths that they go are for the Alberta region, they just clip by the Northern uh, Great Lakes regions. Um, and so that actually has a phrase and they're known as Alberta clippers. They just move really quickly. In November, the other area of cyclogenesis or storm formation is right around here in the panhandle of Oklahoma and Texas. Their typical path is to kind of hook down and then head right for the Great Lakes. Um, and so we often call those a panhandle hooker. They just form on the lee side of the Rocky Mountains um, and then rip up towards the Great Lake regions. This is the storm that's gonna cause the problems for the Edmund Fitzgerald or the climatology that will lead to that. Okay, so on uh, a day with the fits uh, on early uh, Sunday morning, November 5th, November 9th, 1975, uh, the Edmund Fitzgeralds is in the Duluth Superior Locks, um, loading up enough iron ore to make 7,500 automobiles. And again, this was automobiles that were made in 1975, which were much more heavier than the types of uh, automobiles that are being made uh, today. Uh, as I mentioned, I showed you the picture of those iron ore pellets. They slide down huge chutes into the 21 hatchways into the middle of uh, the boat. And then once they're secured, once they're in the hatch, the crew anchors each of those seven ton hatches using uh, 68 special clamps uh, to seal uh, those hatchways. And before shortly, shortly before 2 p.m., uh, the Fitzgerald is ready to depart and leaves on the open waters of Lake Superior. As it leaves, what does the weather look like? Well. The storm has matured overnight. So this is what the surface weather map looks like at 7 a.m. now on November 9th. Um, again, I was talking about that low down in here. Now the low has moved up in here. You can see the blue lines are getting spaced together, which means the wind speed is picking up. Uh, we have a cold front dipping down into Texas 
And we have a warm front designated by the red lines with the uh, half moons also colored in uh, red. And again, the shaded regions is where we're seeing it starting to rain. So this is what the weather map uh, looked like Sunday morning uh, on the 9th. There's a 999 millibar low over Wich uh, Wich Wichita, Kansas. Uh, and the cold front is digging into uh, Texas as well. In terms of what does it look like up in the Great Lakes regions, uh, up in uh, uh, Wisconsin, there's a little bit of precipitation in central Wisconsin. Um, but the Anderson's captain, uh, who is called Bernie Cooper, recalled years later that uh, on November 9th, 1979, that Sunday was one of the special days on Lake Superior where there's just ripples of water, calm waters, sunny and warm for November. Uh, and as they departed uh, the locks, they could see the Edmunds Fitzgerald. Um, and the two ships, you know, talked and they decided, hey, let's go, they're going to the same place. Let's travel together in this beautiful weather um, that they're currently having. So that's the beginning. Um, they're now off and heading towards Sault Ste. Marie. Also on November 9th, um, I feel like I must show this uh, satellite image uh, taken on November 9th for a couple of reasons. Uh, first is the University of Wisconsin is known as the birthplace of weather satellites. It all began here. Um, 1975, weather satellites were really just coming in to be used routinely in weather forecasting. So it's really hard to get imagery. This is one of those rare satellite images that exist that we've been able to get our hands on. Um, what we see here, all the white is where it's cloudy. Uh, again, here's the cold front. You can see it's getting pretty well developed. Here's the warm front out ahead. This area in between where it's cloud free is what we call the dry slot. And if you look at this whole system, it sort of takes on a comma shape, right? There's the head of the comma and there's the tail of the comma. And so um, looking at satellite imagery early on in the 1970s to classify storms, we would often call these mid-latitude cyclones in terms of identifying where is the comma head and where is the comma uh, tail. And this is a classic structure of a developing mid-latitude cyclone. Of course, when we talk about weather, we don't just talk about the current weather. It's also important to talk about forecast and particularly to shipping lanes. Um, that's a, any kind of transport, weather is really, really important. Uh, and on November 9th at 7 p.m., the National Weather Service or NWS, issued gale warnings for Lake Superior. So they were seeing the development of the storm. They were estimating winds to be between 40 and 46 miles per hour. And they predicted that they would be east to northeasterly winds during the night, shifting to northwest to north by the afternoon of November 10th. In the end, not a bad forecast considering the numerical models they had going at the time, the observations and the limited satellite data that they had going on as well as the radar data. At around 2 a.m. November 10th, um, the National Weather Service upgraded their gale warnings to a storm warning, which meant winds between 55 and 63 miles per hour with a prediction of Northwest winds 40 to 57 miles per hour becoming northwesterly with waves between eight and 15 feet high. So around 2 a.m., remember the uh, Anderson and the Fitzgerald are traveling together. They discussed, the two captains discussed the threatening weather and they decided to change their route to be more northerly and along only, uh, Ontario's North Shore. So. Why that route? Well, um, here is again the route that they take. If they were gonna go down this route, then when they would be here, the winds were being predicted to be out of the North East or the North. And so they would be really exposed to open water, which means low friction, which means uh, very strong winds. By 
coming up to the north and going along the coast of Canada and Ontario in here, they would be somewhat protected by the land and the trees and everything, the friction that occurs up in here. So they wouldn't be as buffered by the winds because of the friction that we would see um, along the land. So that was their reason for moving uh, to that northerly directions. Wind travels faster over open water than it does over land. So uh, the impact of those crosswinds would not, would give them protection by hugging the shoreline some more. Um, so yeah, that's what they were predicting the winds to be when they were traveling on this side. At 3 a.m. Uh, on November 10th, uh, the winds were reported as coming from the Northeast at about 42 knots, which is about 48 miles per hour. Again, the Fitzgerald and the Anderson are proceeding together with the Fitzgerald ahead of the Anderson. And they were in radio contact uh, the whole time. By 7 a.m., the storm passed over Marquette, Michigan and started its path uh, across Lake Superior. So what did the weather look like at 7 a.m. Uh, on this day, November 10th? Well, here's the weather map uh, for that day. Again, here's the mid-latitude mid cyclone, cold front, warm front, um, and the occluded front. Uh, you can see now the blue lines are really well-spaced, tight grid, which means the winds are gonna be humming along, uh, particularly over the open waters, um, as we see because uh, the National Weather Service was predicting winds almost 50 miles uh, per hour. So a very well-developed mid-latitude cyclone looked very much, if you were around in 1998, it looked very much like the same thing on November 10th uh, of that day. In the song, um, you know, uh, uh, the song goes, and late that night when the ship bell rang, could it be the north wind they'd been feeling? And so what Gordon Lightfoot here is really uh, doing is he's pointing out uh, the future of you know, what might be happening. You know, this is perhaps not what they had hoped for um, when they changed their route on how they were gonna get across uh, Lake Superior. Go into the song again. When the gales of November come slashing, when the afternoon came, it was freezing rain in the force of a hurricane west wind. So what we're showing up here is the observations at two stations, Milwaukee, Michigan, and we're looking at wind speed on the x-axis. So 70 knots, remember 40 knots uh, is close to uh, 50 miles per hour is a quick number. And then Sault Ste. Marie. Again, the wind speed on this side, uh, and then the pressure on this side. The uh, pressure uh, at Marquette uh, is shown in the red line, and at Sault Ste. Marie, it's in the blue line. Uh, and then the black line are the observations of what the wind speed was during those times. Um, and as the pressure gradient gets tighter, the wind speeds get up. And the, the triangles here, um, represent the maximum wind gust. So that's sort of like a puff uh, wind gust. These other winds are sustained winds. So at here at around uh, 12 noon on the 10th, the winds were sustained at about 30 miles per hour. Um, and Marquette was measuring gusts up to 55 uh, knots. So again, you know, Good phrase to be singing in a ballad, uh, meteorologically, not quite right um, in the sense that for a hurricane, even a category one hurricane, which is the weakest, to be classified that you need to have winds that are sustained at 64 to 82 knots or 74 to 95 miles per hour. Um, so you can see they're hitting gusts of 62 knots or so. So not quite um, reaching that category of, uh, um, of a hurricane. Nonetheless, I would not want to be in those winds or in that storm, uh, particularly on an open lake. All right, on the uh, afternoon of November 10th, um, a wind shift as, you know, was being told uh, or pretended in the uh, ballad 
uh, was obviously evident. Um, so at 2.45 p.m., uh, the winds had backed or they had been counterclockwise and they were now coming from the northwest and were at 42 knots. Um, steady winds at 43 knots, almost 50 miles per hour. And the waves that were reported by the Anderson were 12 to 16 feet high. Um, again, rough seas to be on from my standards. Um, at around 3.30 p.m., the Fitzgerald contacted the Anderson. Remember, they were traveling together, the Fitzgerald just ahead. And the Fitzgerald reported that they had a fence rail down, two vents lost or damaged, and a list. So also around this time, the storm had been gotten so strong and so fierce that it closed the Sault Ste. Marie locks. The thing about the fence rail down and two vents lost or damaged and a list tells us a couple of things. One is water is likely, come, not only the strong winds are blowing things around, but water is also being uh, getting into the boat. So the boat is listing, which means it's tilting, uh, which means it's probably taken on water, causing it to have that, uh, that list. And as, uh, Gordon Lightfoot points out, the winds in the wires made a tattletale sound and a wave broke over the railing. Um, so he's describing what the situation is like. And again, pointing out that they are not in a really good situation uh, at this time. Although as we'll see, the danger that the Fitzgerald was in, they really had no idea of the severity of the situation. Now let's go back to the shift in the winds to the Northwest and why that's important uh, for what happened to the Edmund Fitzgerald. So if the winds are coming from the Northwest, then remember they changed this route because they thought the winds would be coming from the Northeast or the North and they would be buffeted and protected by the land. But now they're along this line and the winds are coming from the Northwest. So the winds have this all open lake to pick up steam, um, generate large waves and just buffer uh, the heck out of the boat. The other important thing about this open water, which we call the fetch, is that it allows large waves to build up so that you can get these 16 foot, 20 foot waves. So let me tell you a little bit about how these wind waves get generated. And there are three things that are important that determine how big they get. The first of course is the wind speed. The stronger the wind, the larger the force on the water, and the bigger the wave that they can generate. But the wave, uh, the wind has to be constant. So it's not just the gust. But still, we have 40 knot winds constant uh, going on. So that's a really good, uh, strong wind speed. The second, with regard to determining how big the waves get, is the duration of the wind. So the longer the winds blow over the open water, the larger the waves. And then the third thing is the fetch or the distance of the open water over which the wind blows. The longer the fetch, the larger the waves. So let's take a look at observations and theory of what that looks like. So again, we're looking now at the maximum wave height, which is over here on the left uh, in feet. So that's a 40 foot wave. Uh, and then the wind speed in knots or in kilometers per hour. And this blue line is a theoretical estimate of what the maximum height would be. So if it was an duration was unlimited and the fetch was unlimited. So we had, for example, winds just blowing over the Atlantic Ocean for a long time with a 40 knot wind, you can generate a 30 foot wave. Uh, on these ships, they also make estimates of what the uh, wave height is. And so here are some of the different ship observations with regard to the wind speed that they measured along with the wave height that they estimated. So I'm just, you know, we could look at this and try and explain it, but I'm just gonna point out that we were getting observations or the lake, the ships are making observations of 20 foot waves during this time period. And so again, um, no surprise that you could imagine 
uh, in the ballad, uh, the uh, cook saying, uh, when he came on deck saying, fellas, it's too rough to feed you. I mean, 20 foot waves, um, again, would be an extremely uh, strong, uh, a really rough sea to be in. Going back to the song again, continuing with that, um, at 7 p.m., a main hatchway caved in. He, referring to the cook, said, fellas, it's been good to know you. The captain wired in, he had water coming in and the good ship and crew was in peril. peril. And later that night, when its lights went out of sight, came the wreck of the Edmund Fitzgerald. So there's a couple of things about this that I wanna point out. First is, um, you know, there's indication, as we'll see, that, that uh, the captain knew that water was coming in or he suspected it because he had a list. And as we'll see, he had his pumps turned on to try and get any water out um, of, of the boat. And while the phrase of this song is very romantic and it sounds like the crew knew they were doomed, in reality, the sinking of the Edmund Fitzgerald was very rapid and it's very likely they had no idea of the seriousness uh, of their conditions um, or, or the peril that they were actually in. Um, and we'll see that as we go through the talk. The other thing I wanna point out about this phrase um, is, is again of interest in terms of the storyline. Again, the line of the original song is at 7 p.m. a main hatchway caved in. He said, fellas, it's been good to know you. So that was the original line. Um, in 2010, uh, Lightfoot actually changed the lyrics of that line to say, at 7 p.m., it grew dark. It was then he said, fellas, it's been good to know you. So if you listen to the radio, you'll still get this first phrase. But if you ever hear Gordon Lightfoot live, which I did it a few years ago, he's changed the words to sing that way. And the reason why he did it was out of respect for the family. Um, one thing we know for sure in terms of the sinking of the boat, or highly suspect, I should say, is that they were taking on water. Um, initially, the National Transportation Safety Board um, came to the conclusion or uh, supported the conclusion that the water was coming in through the hatchways. Um, but there's no real evidence that that was happening. Um, if it's getting into the hatchways, it may be implying that some of the sailors didn't tighten down the hatchways uh, good enough. Um, and so the families I know didn't like uh, that explanation because there is no real evidence for it. Um, there's no real evidence in any way of how water was getting in other than the idea that water must have been getting in be, based on what the observations and what the whole picture uh, puts together. And my understanding is that Lightfoot had gotten close to some of the family members. So out of respect for them, he changed change the word of that phrase to it grew dark. It was then he said, fellas, it's been good to know you. But if you ever had the opportunity to see Gordon Lightfoot live, um, go listen to him sing this song and watch the audience when he sings this new phrase because most of the audience doesn't know that and they get very, very confused uh, about what the wording is. All right, a little bit there about the song. Um, in the middle of these howling winds, snow, sea spray, something goes wrong. Right, and around 3.20 p.m., McSorley, who's the pilot on the uh, Fitzgerald, calls Cooper on the radio and says, Anderson, this is the Fitzgerald. And again, this is from a recording from uh, the documentation. I have sustained some topside damage. I have a fence rail laid down, two vents lost or damaged, and a lift. I'm checking, which means he's slowing down. Um, and he asks, the Anderson, will you stay with me till we get to Whitefish Bay? Um, so again, very reflective of what Gordon Wrightfoot uh, wrote in the song with regard to a fence rail down. Uh, the response of the Anderson is, Charlie on that Fitzgerald, do you have your pumps going? Uh, and the Fitzgerald replies, yes, both of them. So something has clearly damaged the Fitzgerald Clearly the captain suspects that water is being taken on um, and um, he, that's why he has his pumps uh, running at the time. 
one other thing I want to point out now, and I want you to imagine this, is imagine if you have a pile of sand uh, sitting on your table or your desk or your floor, and you were to pour some water on it. That water would not leak out onto your desk or onto your floor. That water would initially fill the air spaces between those grains of sand. I think that something similar is happening with those raw with those pellets. That as water is getting in, it's filling those air spaces, and so it's hard to get that water out um, via the pumps. So. Um, as we look to what's going on continuing through that day on the 10th, um, the windstorm continues to intensify at around 4.10 p.m. Uh, the gusts of the wind blow away the Fitzgerald's radar antenna. It knocks out power at Whitefish Bay. Uh, at 5 p.m., the lighthouse at Standard Rock, north of Marquette, um, uh, also loses power. Um, which is the closest station to Fitzgerald at the time. And it uh, records gusts of 76 miles uh, per hour. Cooper on board the Anderson at one point estimated the wind gusts were more than 100 miles per hour. So really strong winds. At 6 p.m., McSorley uh, again reaches out to the captain, uh, the ship captain of the Anderson via radio and says, I have a bad list, lost both radars and I'm taking heavy seas over the deck. One of the worst seas I've ever been in. I, I wanna call out that uh, later on, but I point it here because he's the only captain who actually referred to this as being the worst seas that they've ever been in. And he was a very experienced uh, pilot. Um, and so he's been in very rough seas, but these are the worst ones that he's ever been in. Meanwhile, the Anderson again is still traveling with them. It's 10 miles behind uh, the Fitzgerald. Um, again, since uh, the Fitzgerald you know, lost its radars, the Anderson is helping by providing uh, navigation instructions. And at 7, 10 p.m., uh, it uh, contacts the Fitzgerald uh, and gives them some navigation instructions uh, to the Fitzgerald, uh, who's up ahead on, on, on the direction that they're handling. Uh, the Anderson's first met, mate asks, oh, by the way, how are you making out with your problems? And the Fitzgerald replies, we are holding our own. Immediately after that conversation, there's a severe snow squall that enshrouds both boats. Um, you lose visibility uh, in that, um, if you're living in Wisconsin, I'm sure you've experienced the snow squall. Um, Short-lived visibility goes out. Radars are again in 75, not as, as strong as they are now. Um, so the Anderson loses temporary uh, uh, radar uh, detection of the Fitzgerald as well. And then just as suddenly as that uh, snow squall came up, it kind of ends and it disappears and visibility becomes excellent. Um, as reported by the Anderson, um, they can see lights from ships coming north from Sault Ste. Marie, um, but from the Anderson's point of view, the Fitzgerald is nowhere to be found. Even with the clear weather, there are no lights uh, indicating the Fitzgerald, uh, there's no radar blip, uh, and there is no radar contact. Captain Cooper, you know, again, he's looking for the Fitzgerald. Uh, he's wondering how the heck can you lose a 730 foot oil freighter in the middle of a lake? Uh, he contacts the Coast Guard in Sault Ste. Marie um, with his concerns, um, saying, this is the Anderson. I am very concerned with the welfare of the steamer, Edmund Fitzgerald. I see no lights as before, and I don't have him on radar. I just hope he didn't take a nosedive. So in that short amount of time of a squall line to go by in a few minutes, the Anderson is gone. So, um, you know, there's been a lot of uh, activity after that, uh, both going down to the lake where the, where the ship is. Um, they've also recovered some of the lifeboats. And again, if you can look at the condition of those lifeboats, you can see that there was no attempt uh, made to leave the ship. Um, uh, no, um, you know, no call for sailors to put on life jackets or anything like that, no distress 
signals were given. Uh, indeed, while the Fitzgerald knew they were having problems, they were running their pumps and they were holding their own. So they really didn't know the, you know, what was about to happen. Nobody knew, uh, right, what was about to happen. And this is again reflected in the, in the ballad. Does anybody know where the love of God goes when the waves turn the minutes to hours? The searchers all say they'd have made Whitefish Bay if they put 15 miles behind them. They might have split up or they might have capsized. They may have broke deep or took water. So what happened? Um, there are a couple of theories of what sank uh, the Edmund Fitzgerald, uh, the Marine Casualty Report uh, was one of the earliest ones. Um, again, by the board, uh, the Coast Guard Marine Board Investigation Report. Again, since there are no survivors and no witnesses, the report was based on testimony uh, as well as conversation as well as some underwater surveys uh, of the wreck. Um, one thing that it does suggest uh, is that the Fitzgerald was taking on water uh, in some way uh, due to some earlier damage, but from the storm uh, uh, and then around 7.15 p.m. It, had, it plunged headfirst into a large wave and sank abruptly. So the question is uh, often asked with regard to what brought this storm, what brought the, uh, the ship down, where was there a problem with the hatch covers? Was water getting in that way? Um, was it bottoming out um, at the six fathom shoals and therefore had a crack um, and took on water that way? Uh, was it stress factors uh, in the boat? Was that the reason that the ship went down? Uh, or was it a rogue wave that just hit the ship and took the Fitzgerald down and no other? So there's a lot of theories of what it is. Um, my theory is basically it was the weather. If it was a nice day, the ship would not have sunk, right? So the weather played a key role in, um, in uh, the sinking of the Edmund Fitzgerald. There've been a couple of, uh, dives down to the shipwreck. And I, I wanna show this one and then I'll tell you what, what, what I think happened with regard to how it sank and why. Um, this was a, a sketch of the, uh, the wreck of the Edmund Fitzgerald on the bottom of Lake Superior uh, from one of the Coast Guard Marine casualty reports to one of the submerged boats they went and looked at um, what it was. It's in 530 feet um, of water. Uh, one of the things that you can um, tell by this is um, hard to tell if there are any cracks on the bottom, but we don't know if there are any cracks on the bottom of the bow half. So it, it broke in half. Uh, the front of the boat really demonstrates uh, that it plowed, you know, into the bottom uh, of the lake uh, and then fell over. So we know it kind of took a nosedive. So based on, you know, the readings that I have done, um, um, about, about the boat, some of the reports. Um, what, what I think it happened in terms of why it went down is of course the storm played a key role um, or played the role uh, in bringing it down. For some reason, water was getting into the boat, right? There could be a number of reasons why there's no evidence to really justify one method uh, or another. So let's just accept that water is getting into the boat, into the cargo holes, filling those spaces that the talconite pellets are in the cargo bay. Um, we know that it's taking on water, I think for a couple of reasons. One is it has a list, um, which means that it's probably taken on water. Uh, the, the captain clearly thinks he is, and that's why he's running both pumps, uh, trying to get out water that might be in the, in the cargo bays. Uh, and then the other thing I think, which is, uh, again, incidental, but I think important is that the captain says that the, and again, a very experienced captain saying these are the roughest seas he has ever been in, right? So you can imagine if you're in a boat and you're taking on extra water, the weight of that boat is gonna get heavier and heavier. So the boat is gonna sit lower and lower in the water. Uh, and the more water you take on, the lower you're gonna get. So these 16, 20 foot waves, which are still really big, are gonna look even bigger, right? Because your perspective has changed. 
when that squall line comes, uh, again, the boat is steaming along, not at 16 miles per hour, but still heading. Um, and because it's so big and so heavy, it has a lot of momentum. Um, so now a big wave comes, you hit that wave and what happens to the boat and its momentum, it slows down. Now you have a cargo bay full of metal balls. You have a little delay. You can imagine if you're on a bus or in a car or a bus standing, somebody puts on the brakes, you're gonna go forward, right? So all of those pellets or many of those pellets rush to the bow of the boat. Um, all the weight goes to the bow of the boat, the bow goes down, the boat breaks on the surface and sinks to the bottom. And there's some evidence of that. This is another sketch of the bow on the bottom, 276 feet of it. Um, and then over here is the stern of the boat, 253 feet. Um, you can see one is deck side up and the other one is deck side down. Um, this is the orientation. Um, and this area here is a large area of where the wreckage was, where many pellets uh, were found. Um, and the debris field suggests that those pellets came out near the surface, not near the bottom uh, when it hit the bottom. So that's why I think it, it broke up uh, up top. Again, he's ending the ballot by um, the, in the musty hall in Detroit. They prayed in the Maritime Sailors Cathedral, the church bell chimed. They rang 29 times for each man on the Edmund Fitzgerald. The legend lives on from the Chippewa on down. On the big league they called Kichikumi, not quite right. Um, Superior, they said, never gives up their dead in the gales of November come early. And so this is uh, the bell of the ship. They had recovered that uh, and brought it up and uh, put it in the museum. Of course, again, this is a disaster. It's important as we talk about this, and I've said this a couple of times to remember that we've lost 29 souls in that. Um, I would also point out that the sinking and the investigation led to changes in the Great Lakes shipping regulations um, and practices. And that included having mandatory, mandatory survival suits, depth finders in case they did touch bottom, positioning systems so they know where they are at all times, increased freeboard so that they would remain higher in the water um, and also more frequent inspection of what the vessels are, the conditions. Again, I wanna point out that, you know, there is always gonna be another extratropical cyclone like the one we had that sunk the Edmund Fitzgerald like we had in 1998 and like we had in 1940, um, but the people are unique and irrepulsable and their loss will be felt uh, forever and never replaced. So I'm gonna end and then we could take some questions by noting again, one of the uh, phrases from the wreck of the Edmund Fitzgerald, the legend lives on. I think it will always live on um, because of the uniqueness of the storm, uh, the ballad that made it famous, um, the ship, which was uh, you know the American pride of the American side and the fact that we don't really know why it went down. We have a lot of theories but again, we don't really know the exact answers. So with that, I am going to stop sharing my screen and we'll see what kind of questions we have. I Thanks, Steve. My... <laughs> there we go. Okay, great. Did that work? Did I stop sharing? Yep, yep, I'm just seeing you. You did great. Oh, great, good. So Steve, we did get some questions in and uh, a number of them were about um, the human that Edmund, th that the ship that was, was named for. And actually Abigail asked a question and Alan answered it <laughs> in the Oh, in the good, yeah. Yeah, that, that worked out well. So Abigail had asked who was a human, Edmund Fitzgerald, for whom the ship was named. And Ellen said, it might interest the audience to know that Mr. Edmund Fitzgerald lived in Milwaukee and was the CEO of the Northwestern Mutual Life Insurance Company, which owned the boat. The insurance company named the boat after him. He was alive when the boat was launched and was alive when it sank. He was my father's boss. My father, my father and Mr. Fitzgerald often spoke about the sinking and Mr. Fitzgerald said he was haunted by the sinking and loss of life. Yeah. And uh, Bill, Bill had asked as well, do you have any additional information regarding the man the ship was named? Um, 
No, I don't. But um, I had known who it was named after and the fact that it was the insurance company. And uh, if I give this talk again, I will make sure to add that as part of the information uh, about the ship itself. That's, a, that's an important point. Why was it named? Uh, who was it named after? Got it. Good. Let's see. Um, so Katie asked, was it relatively common to get water coming into those hatchways full of ore pebbles? And was it hard to get it out since it would fill up air pockets first? Yeah, it, it would be hard to get it out. I don't think it was all that common. Otherwise they would have, you know, uh, for example, recognized that when they unloaded them, they would all have been wet. And so they would have been like, where, where did this water come from? Um, but, but yeah, I think it would be really hard to get out. Um, and again, my mind visually is you, you pour water on sand, um, you know, and, and that water doesn't come out until uh, it essentially evaporates uh, or you move it around um, and expose that water. And I think that was the problem is that the water was getting in there, couldn't get it out, didn't know it was in there. Um, and that kind of just um, led to problems uh, throughout the, uh, the, those fateful days. Thank you. Connie asked, do we know when the Coast Guard arrived on the scene? Was there any hope for rescue? Any bodies recovered on the shore? Uh, no bodies were recovered. Um, and I think part of that is, you know, many of them were secured away, um, didn't know they were in a danger of about to be uh, uh, sink. So there was no attempt to, uh, to, um, to, to, to uh, evacuate the boat. Uh, what I remember from the Coast Guards is that after uh, Anderson called into the Coast Guard and said he was worried about it, the Coast Guard took a while to come out because uh, the waters were really, really rough um, and they would have had a hard time getting out. Having said that, there were other ships in the area, you know, on the lake at the time, and they did help go look to try and find uh, where the Fitzgerald was and if there was anybody in the water. So in addition to the um, Coast Guard trying to get out there, but having a difficult time because of the roughness, the ships that were out there did try and help. Katie asks another question. Do you think there will be future dives that will reveal answers? Um, you know, I think it's a, it's a, um, it's a, it's not a security, it's, it's a, um, uh, a designated area now where you can't go down to uh, unless uh, you know, you, you're an official and get official approval to do that. Um, I doubt that there will be, um, I don't know for sure, but I doubt there will be because there've been a number of trips down there. And while they discover a little bit here and there, um, they haven't found anything that will really indicate what had happened. And I don't anticipate that any other uh, mission down there would actually reveal anything new. And they brought the bell up as a memor as a memorial. Um, uh, yeah. Uh, so let's see, uh, David asks, would modern weather predictions have better predicted the storm and location and perhaps given the information to stop this trip? In other words, how has weather prediction improved since the sinking? Yeah, that's a great question, David. And weather prediction has improved immensely. Uh, for one, uh, we have a heck of a lot more satellite data up there. Those satellite data is now feed, fed into the numerical weather prediction models. Uh, the weather prediction models have gotten better because computers have gotten a lot faster. So the models can become more complex. And our knowledge about how the atmosphere has worked works um, has enabled those forecasts to get a lot better. So this forecast um, in 1998 was essentially the same uh, as the storm that sank the Edmund Fitzgerald. And that 1998 storm was really well forecast in terms of the intensity of the winds, as well as the timing, uh, which was the real issue in this, the sinking of the Edmund Fitzgerald because the timing was off in the forecast and that made the Anderson and the Fitzgerald to change their route. Um, so yeah, and as I, I like to point out the 1998 storm didn't kill anybody um, because the forecast was much better and the dissemination of the forecast uh, was much better. And I think now not only are the forecasts really good, 
but you know, we get, we, we don't have to turn on the television to get those forecasts or turn on the radio, right? We can just look at our smartphone um, and find out what those forecasts are. Excellent. Let's see if there's maybe one more question because we're getting, uh, we're at eight o'clock right now. Let's see. Uh, da, 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 da. I'm just looking through. Basically, there, we, we could continue on till 10 o'clock <laughs> with the good questions that came in, but uh, we won't be able to. Um, so let's see, I think um, a, lot of, a lot of compliments about yeah, a, a very interesting presentation. And I know we had, um, gosh, about 150, 160 people uh, attending wow. tonight, so. Let's see if there's anything else I can add. Um, you know, one other thing I'll add about the 1940 storm, you know, uh, which killed something like 150 something duck hunters. Uh, it was very similar. Um, again, they didn't know it was coming. Uh, uh, that's why they all went out duck hunting because uh, like the Anderson said on uh, November 8th and 9th, it was such a beautiful day, calm, you know, wonderful November day. and. Uh, and in Minnesota and in Wisconsin, a lot of duck hunters took advantage of that and went duck hunting. Uh, and then the storm rapidly moved in um, and temperatures really dropped. And with the wind speed, there was really uh, severe um, wind chills, cold wind chills as well. And that 1940 storm, uh, I, I don't know how many people have seen this, but as a kid, you know, and, and in physics, we were always showed the, uh, uh, the Tacoma Narrows Bridge, how it, vibrates and then eventually collapses. Um, that was the beginning of the storm as it hit North America uh, and then became the Armistice Day storm in the upper Midwest in 1940. Um, so kind of an interesting connection there. Indeed. Well, I, uh, one question uh, that came through that I think is important to mention is how can people uh, reach out to you if uh, they want to discuss the topic further? Um, do you... Uh, do you want to put um, your email address in the chat or would they, is there- Yeah, a I can put my email address in the chat. And if they okay. don't have a pen uh, to write it down. Um, well, I can also I, check. If you just remember I'm with the University of Wisconsin, it won't take you very long to find my email address. <laughs> <laughs> I'm thinking- I'm And, and I'm be... happy to hear you know, questions that people have. It may take me a day or two to get back to you. Uh, but particularly, you know, if, if there were personal connections that people have, like um, the uh, person, I forget who it was now, David, maybe, who talked about how, you know, they had a connection to um, uh, the Fitzgerald and to their, uh, their mutual insurance insurance company. Those are always interesting stories for me to hear. Excellent. Well, let's see. Um, I think I will... Just get ready to, actually, um, Lisa, if you want to um, give your closing remarks and then I will follow up uh, before we end with last words. Okay, Steve, that was fascinating and very well presented. I'm really not sure why I picked this topic, but I'm very glad that I did. And, and I think we all got a, a wonderful education this evening. And um, I'll never hear that ballad again without getting a tear in my eye. So yeah, thank it's... you. Yeah. Go You're ahead. welcome. Thank no, you. No, I was just going to say it is a fascinating story. And uh, I grew up on the East Coast. And so I heard about it. I was graduating as an undergrad when it went down and was like, wow, how could that happen? Uh, and then when I moved to Wisconsin, I was just like, wow, this is fascinating. Uh, and that got me into uh, looking at this in more detail. Yeah. Well, thank you again. Yes, thank you again, Steve. And uh, tomorrow, about seven o'clock, about the same time tomorrow night, you'll get an email that will uh, have a link to the recording. And uh, with that, I will stop the recording and wish all of you a good evening. Goodbye. Goodbye, and thanks, everyone. Bye, Steve.